Good morning. Welcome to the Deep 404. Uh, there's no update or no real update on the uh, possible shoot down of the Russian A-50 AWACS plane and the Aleutian IL-22 uh, aerial command post. Now, day, day ago, we got reports about these having been shot down over the sea of Azov. The Ukrainians claimed that, claimed that they had shot them down and this uh, the, the evidence they provided was um, reportedly a video of radar, their radar tracking of those planes over the sea of Azov and then them disappearing, uh, going off on the radar. Um, what is interesting about that is that there are subsequent reports that at least the IL-22 returned s s to base. Um, now, <clears throat> the reason that the radar piece of information is interesting is because if the plane had been destroyed, you imagine it would drop off radar, but if it flew back to base, you imagine it would have remained on radar. Now, if it did fly back to base, then the data about them dropping off the radar perhaps doesn't make sense, maybe. Anyhow, um, there's still there's no confirmation from the Russian Ministry of Defence about this, and there's still no clear confirmation on the A-50, and I think it kind of ranges from an A-50 went missing to... There was no issue at all with an A-50. So we're still waiting just to hear on what's happening there. The IL-22, it appears as though there was damage to this plane. So it does appear as though it has been, well, I guess, struck by some sort of air defence. Um, a lot of people questioning the ability of the Ukrainians to have been able to reach the distance at which that plane was operating when it apparently went off the radar map. Now, on the Sea of Azov, the plane was doing these racetrack movements as they do, scanning an area, going around like this. Uh, at parts of that, at the top of it, it does get into an area where it could have been struck. Where it goes off the map, it's quite a distance away. Um, who knows? Perhaps it was struck by um, a, a Patriot missile, perhaps... Um, perhaps um, at the top of its circuit and minimal damage was done, it travelled down the rest of its circuit and then it needed to leave. It realised it did have damage. Again, that doesn't really work with the story of what is meant to have happened in terms of there being injuries to the, and to the uh, occupants of that plane. The other story being that it was a Russian-friendly fire episode, um, which I think on the on the whole, is probably um, more likely, while embarrassing for the Russians, because this has happened and appears a number of times there have been reports of Russian-friendly fire issues. There is some f um, friend or foe system that operates as part of the air defence. I guess the planes present some sort of a signature to be able to indicate to their own air defence that they are a friendly Perhaps that doesn't work. I don't, I don't know what has happened there. Um, but at this stage, I would say it is still unclear as to exactly what has happened. Um, on the other topic of in is, uh, interest at the moment, Lloyd Austin, the US Secretary of Defence, as we know, he has been um, somewhat out of action since at least the 1st of January. Um, possibly longer to some extent. He had surgery reportedly for prostate cancer on the 22nd of December last year, then went home and then returned, uh, this is the Pentagon story, returned to uh, ICU at Walter Reed pardon me, Military Hospital on the 1st of January. It was in ICU for four days, at, well, at least four days. He was at Walter Reed until yesterday. He's reportedly gone home now. Um Still no good uh, video evidence indicating to him that he is alive and well and, and, and not damaged and bandaged around the head and all that sort of thing, which would be unusual if he's had a urinary tract infection. There, there was a report yesterday that he has returned home and left the hospital. There is a report today on the US Defence website um, and it talks about there being a readout from the Defence Secretary Lloyd Austin speaking with the Ukrainian Minister of Defence. I'll just read out what's on the website. Secretary of Defence Lloyd J. Austin III spoke by phone today with Ukrainian Minister of Defence Rustem Umarov. 
To discuss the latest on the situation on the ground and the upcoming virtual Ukraine Defence Contact Group, UDCG, meeting on January the 23rd. Secretary Austin reiterated that the United States and our coalition of some 50 allies and partners remain committed to supporting Ukraine in its fight against Russian aggression. The two leaders pledged to remain in close contact. And this was then... Um, the leading line into this was attributed to Pentagon Press Secretary Major General Pat Ryder. So it appears as though Major Pat Ryder, General Major General Pat Ryder, has made this brief announcement about Lloyd Austin speaking to Defence Minister uh, Rus- Rustem Umarov. Um, no actual readout from the conversation provided on the website that I could see even though it it sort of titles it as a a readout. Um, And again, no images of um, Lloyd Austin. Um, I would have thought, clearly there's plenty of articles out there going on about this now in the Western press about the possibility, the the conspiracy theory that he was injured in Ukraine. Uh, One would have thought that would be very easy to dispel and point the fingers at everyone and go, ha ha, just by showing a brief video of him in the hospital or a video on his way home or something like that. And there's been none of that. Um, This leads me to speculate that while he may be alive, that perhaps the... Perhaps he has been injured. You know, he may have been injured in the face or the head as part of what has happened to him. And that area of him is bandaged. And for that reason, they can't show any video because if they were to show videos of him alive and well with his head wrapped in bandages, people would question, well, why has that happened if he's had a urinary tract infection? I'm speculating here, of course, but I still feel like this hasn't resolved. Now, if in three months' time... Pictures come out of Lloyd Austin and he's just left home and he's back to work. You know, even then, you're going to question, well, really, did that happen because of a urinary tract infection? But that may have given time for all of the other wounds, if they were there, to have healed and be able to do that. Of course, I'm just speculating on this one. Hey, and some other news here. Uh, British Defence Secretary Grant Shapps, he has come out and announced today that since 2014... 60,000 Ukrainian troops have been trained in the UK in UK military training programs. These service people have undergone British and NATO training with NATO weapons and tactics. So this is an interesting point because if you remember the Western story as this conflict with Ukraine had began was that this was an unprovoked attack by Russia. Russia just decided one day to go and attack Ukraine for no reason, no provocation. Now, we know that this isn't the case, and we know that there you know, were the, um, uh, the the Minsk agreements, which were not adhered, adhered to by Ukraine and the West. We've had Angela Merkel talk about that and confirm that. Um, but here we have the current British Defence Secretary, Grant Shapps, stating that 60,000 Ukrainian troops since 2014 have been trained in the UK in NATO and British defence um, tactics and processes and protocols using NATO weapons. Um, so this is now just a clear indication that the West has been operating nato wising if you like, Ukraine since at least 2014. Um, you can Google this and you can find that there's lots of information about British and American PMCs, private military companies operating as consultants and trainers in Ukraine and training them you know, for, since 2014. So this isn't really new news. It's just an interesting thing to have the British Secretary of Defence um, come out and confirm for everyone like this. And it does put a bit of a a hole in that story that this was a completely unprovoked attack by Russia. Uh, The Davos meeting, the World Economic Forum, um, group of powerful and influential people, their meeting in Switzerland, um, President Zelensky of Ukraine is there. Um, Thus far, it doesn't appear as though it has been a successful Davos meeting for him. He reports are that he requested Switzerland to establish a large peace conference. Um, reporting is that a number of nations are not interested in the peace plan, that some of them rejected it or, um, or decided not to attend. 
China reportedly was invited to attend this peace uh, conference. Uh, they declined to send a delegate, is the reporting that I've seen. And this is um, clearly because Russia is not involved in these com in conversations. And there was some reporting I said yes, I saw yesterday that indicated that some of the countries invited actually were suggesting that Russia needed to be here. If this was going to be actually a peace conference about peace in Ukraine, that Russia needed to be involved. Um, what Zelensky, President Zelensky, seems to be pushing is something which is just considered unrealistic by many people. He's talking about a peace, a peace plan where um, Ukraine will not give anything. Ukraine will be returned all of its land back to the pre-1991 borders. Russia will pay reparations to Ukraine. Um, I don't know how in the real world President Zelensky thinks that this will happen given the situation on the front line where we have talk now of um, the the United States and Biden's administration speaking to the Zelensky administration and saying, you guys, if you want any more funding, you need to do as we say. And what it looks like we want you to do at the moment is you need to just defend. Defensively, hold the line because we've got to figure out how we make this look good to get Joe Biden back in in November 2024. So it's a long time. It's 10 months we've got to get through. Um, you're not going on a new, inf new offensive because that's not going to do any good. It's going to look bad. So you're going to have to just defend really well. Um, so I don't see how yeah, President Zelensky feels that he's going to achieve some peace deal without talking to Russia, which is going to involve Russia giving up all the land that it's captured thus far. Anyhow, that's part of what's going on at Davos. Um, there were some updates about the Russian missile strikes, recent ones on the 12th and 13th of January, those strikes there, reports that one of the targets hit was the impulse plant in Shostka in the Sumy region. Um, there have been a lot of missile attacks that are in the Kharkov and Sumy region, the sort of northeastern area of Ukraine. But this impulse plant in the Sumy region uh, is reportedly Ukraine's sole manufacturer of capsules and other devices used for detonating ammunition, uh, detonation caps. Um, so having a, attacked this location, if the attacks have been successful on this location, will mean that the ability of Ukraine to produce shells within Ukraine has now been degraded. Um, I don't know what the production line for um, artillery shells looks like. I don't imagine the, um, the, the, the final the completion, the assembly of them is actually that difficult, and this could perhaps be done anywhere, but the manufacturing of the components that go into them might be more complex. So in this case, detonation caps, it sounds like, have been um, the production of those, the manufacturers of those has been um, degraded. So that itself may be problematic in that Ukraine now needs to find somewhere else where it can re-establish those lines to be able to reproduce those detonation caps to then include them in the assembly of, of shells. Obviously, Ukraine is having... Um, um, struggles in getting ammunition shells from the West. <clears throat> the uh, the chief of the nuclear, chemical, and biological protection troops of the armed forces of the Russian Federation, Lieutenant General Igor Kirillov, he seems to re release these announcements every six months or so. Now. There, if you Google this, I've got a couple of links in here I'll put into the description. Um, but if you Google his title and name, you will get links. Well, at least where I am in the world, I get links to the a Russian Defense Ministry website, but I find that they are blocked. Now, I don't know if that's because they are blocked because I'm outside of Russia and the Russians are blocking access to that. Um, I'm not using a, a VPN specifically to try to get them. I haven't tried that yet. But just general searching, you get links to it and I can't get to the ones on the defense website. However, I can get to other links um, which I've included one of them here. So you can read through the full briefing. But in essence, and he seems to release these every six months or so, um, and he's focused on things like chemical, nuclear, and biological weapons. And um, this most recent report seems to indicate that the US is building up its number of biolabs around the world. Now, if you remember, not last year, but the year before, in 2022, 
there was talk as this conflict sort of began that the US had biolabs in Ukraine. And this was, of course, you know, in the Western press, this was a conspiracy theory and just Russian propaganda. Um, of course, subsequent to that, in June 2022, the Pentagon came out and announced that, yes, it had been operating and involved in biolabs in Ukraine, which were handling dangerous pathogens after originally dismissing them as propaganda. Um, and then, and you, I've got a link here, so you can go and find on this, this is a link to a substack, but you can go and find the video that I'm referring to here. There is then the video of Victoria Newland. pardon me, uh, Victoria Newland being questioned by Senator Marco Rubio in a Senate hearing where she admits that Ukraine do have bioresearch facilities. And it does appear as though Senator Marco Rubio was expecting um, Victoria Newland to say no when he asked. He asked, do, does Ukraine have biolabs? And I think he was expecting just a no. And she goes, um, uh, yes, Ukraine does have bio research facilities, bio labs, research facilities. And she says, and we are now concerned of them losing control of those and the Russians gaining control of them. So yes, the US does have bio labs all around the world. This report talks about the fact that it seems as though the US is attempting to use loopholes and where it has leverage, get into some of the... Um, some of the... Uh, Eastern, Eastern sort of Asian uh, Caucasus area into some of those countries where it has influence and established biolabs there. Um, there hasn't been a great deal of information about what has happened to those biolabs that the Russians may have encountered as they have taken land within Russia. Perhaps the Ukrainians did destroy them all. I imagine if these were US ones, they would have been told very quickly to destroy them. So that may have been some targeted activity. Um, out of interest, the... Uh, the US reportedly, and China has mentioned this in some statements from one of its, I think it's foreign minister some time ago, that the US is the only country opposing the establishment of a verification mechanism for the BWC. The BWC is a bioweapons convention. And so the statement here is saying that the US is the only country opposing establishing a system of verifying that people are adhering to the Bioweapons Convention. Um, yeah, this would be a, you know, some sort of like you have for uh, nuclear facilities where you allow inspectors to come in to look at what you're doing and confirm that, hey, you're actually just testing something that you found to, make, to, under, to identify what it is. You're not actually running it through lots of cell cultures doing gain-of-function work um, because that would be bad if you were doing that. Uh, anyhow... Um, and you can Google around if you want to. If you want to, if you want to sort of verify this, if you think that this is just a conspiracy story, go and have a look. I did a quick Google and I found a um, PDF, which and there were a number of them. Um, but this was in 2012. The U.S. Defense Department provided one million seven hundred and twenty-eight eight hundred and twenty-two thousand dollars to construct the Herson Diagnostic Laboratory for Handling Pathogens in Herson. Um, so it was just one example. There were more, but that was just, just one. Anyhow, that article's come out. If you're interested in that sort of thing, have a read. It's quite a few pages, but um, interesting just to get a feel for what at least the Russians are saying the, the US are doing in Ukraine, which has been, of course, confirmed, and other areas in terms of bioweapons. Particularly if you um, had any interest in COVID or if you are taking any interest in what's now being termed as disease X and what's being mentioned at, again, the Davos Forum and some of those World Economic Forum events. I won't go into that. Now, um, I might do talk about that some other stage if people are interested. Anyhow, I'll just go through a bit of an update on the front line in Ukraine today. Usual thing, this is the Russian Ministry of Defence daily summary. Um, as I always say, because I cop flack about this, um, the, the, I use the Russian Ministry of Defence reporting on this because it is consistent. We get these each day. We get a weekly summary. They don't appear to be wildly... Um, 
fictitious in their reporting of what's happening. They seem to align with other news we uh, news sources we can get about this. So by that I mean Telegram channels posting videos of. Um, NATO pieces of equipment being destroyed, and we see that same information coming up in some of these reports from the Russian Ministry of Defence. Uh, and I find the Russian Ministry of Defence reporting to, in general, um, while it doesn't report upon its own losses, when it reports upon Ukrainian losses, they appear to be, as I say, more verifiable than the um, Ukrainian reports when they report upon their the Russian losses, which seems to often be very difficult to confirm or things they suggest um, can be proven to be to be false. Anyhow, starting up in the northeastern area of Kupiansk, where the Zapad group of forces operate. Um, in the last 24 hours, there's still been fighting around Sinkovka. Um, the Russian forces have reportedly re repelled six attacks by the armed forces of Ukraine's 95th Air Assault Brigade. Um, the Ukrainian losses in terms of servicemen in Kupiansk in the last 24 hours has reportedly 160 servicemen killed or wounded. Three tanks, two of them reportedly Leopard tanks, and two pickup trucks. As we then move down about 90 kilometres to the Krasny Leman area where the centre group of forces operate. They have reportedly repelled four attacks launched by assault groups of the 63rd Mechanised and 25th Air Assault Brigades of the AFU near Chervonaya Dibrova and Yampolovka. Reportedly, the Ukrainian losses yesterday in Krasny Leman uh, account for 250 servicemen killed or wounded, two infantry fighting vehicles and six motor vehicles. In the Donetsk direction, the Yug group of forces are operating. They have reportedly repelled five attacks launched by the assault groups of the 10th Mountain Assault and 24th Mechanised Brigades of the Armed Forces of Ukraine, close to Veseloye and Bogdanovka. Um, in this area, the Russians have been utilising the heavy flamethrower system, the TOS-1 flamethrower thermobaric system. Just a point on that. There is some um, there is some video on the Russian Ministry of Defence Telegram channel uh, yesterday, showing um, showing the shoulder launched single shot uh, thermobaric system. So this is a much smaller round than what is used in the Tos One heavy flamethrower systems but it's the same type of weapon. Uh, so this allows a single man sh shoulder launch to fire a single use device um, up to about 500 meters range, I think, and land a thermobaric explosive shell there. So these, you know, th these will do damage to sort of softer skin vehicles, um, but are primarily, I think, used for um, dug in locations, trenched locations where you have infantry men in there. If you can land one of these shells on them, they work by forming this gas fuel air mix, which expands out, drops down into trenches through open doorways and windows and then ignites. And so it gets extremely hot. Um, so there's an extremely hot flash burn explosion. Plus there is like a vacuum in the area left after the explosion, which causes a shock wave. And both the flash burn and the shock wave are very detrimental to soft, soft skin things like people, of course. Um, anyhow, so the heavy flamethrowers are being used in Donetsk. Um, reports of up to 280 troops killed or wounded today in the Donetsk region, one tank, two infantry fighting vehicles and four motor vehicles. During the counter-battery warfare, one Gvodzika self-propelled artillery system as well as one D-20 gun reportedly destroyed. Moving to the South Donetsk region where the Vostok group of forces are operating, again reports here that they are also utilising heavy flamethrowers, the TOS ones. And they have inflicted damage on the 72nd Mechanised and 79th Air Assault Brigades close to Vladimirovka and Novo Mikolaevka. In South Donetsk, uh, Russian Ministry of Defence reports 
120 Ukrainian troops killed and wounded, two armoured fighting vehicles, two pickup trucks, one US-made M777 artillery system and one MT-12 anti-tank gun. In Zaporozhye direction, close to um, Verbovoye and Rabotino, or Rabotne, Reports are that the Ukrainian forces lost 115 troops killed and wounded, three armoured fighting vehicles, one D-20 howitzer and two D-30 guns. Moving down to Kherson, in this area, this is where the Krinky beachhead has been established and the Ukrainians are continuing to try to hold it, even though there seems to be no strategic or tactical benefit to them doing so. It seems as though this is purely for PR to enable the Ukrainian um, establishment to say, hey, we're over the river. We're actually fighting in the Russian area there, but they're doing this at a very high cost. Reports are that Ukrainian troop losses are 65 servicemen today killed or wounded, four motor vehicles and one M777 artillery system, one M109 Paladin self-propelled artillery system and three Vodzika self-propelled artillery systems. Now, yesterday I spoke about how I've noticed that just in the last couple of days we seem to be seeing a change in the nature of the reporting around the artillery being destroyed by the Russians. So if you, if you do believe this Russian Ministry of Defence reporting, then what they are reporting, there seems to be a recent change in the nature of artillery being struck. We were seeing lots and lots of pieces of fixed artillery you know, the M Star Bs, um, D twenties, D thirties, M triple sevens, that sort of things. These devices, which are uh, fixed, and as you imagine, a fixed piece of artillery is more likely to be struck than a self-propelled one. A self-propelled one can shoot and scoot, so less chance of you being in the same position you fired from. And using if the Ukrainians are using the ANTPQ American supplied counter battery radars. If you're a fixed artillery piece, you fire and you sit there. If you're detected, they can fire right back at you. So seeing more self-propelled pieces being struck at the moment, it, and I may be wrong here, but it's indicating to me that the fixed pieces are being chewed up. There are less of them around, and the Russians are now going after and focusing more of their artillery on the self-propelled pieces. So just in today's reporting there are in Kherson four self-propelled artillery pieces reportedly destroyed also one fixed piece at M777 Zaporozhye two fixed pieces South Donetsk two fixed pieces again another M777 Donetsk one self-propelled and one fixed piece in Krasny Laman no report of artillery and Kupiansk no reported artillery destroyed. And again, that's unusual. So this, I do feel that there is a change in what is happening here. It feels as though Ukrainians are struggling to keep their artillery operational uh, or are losing pieces and are able to replace ones that are damaged. I might, of course, be completely wrong with the analysis here. I've got two days of data here, but that does seem to be a change. And hearing that in Kupiansk and Krasny Laman there are none reported is unusual. Um, so this could indicate that Ukrainians perhaps are husbanding the pieces they have, are looking to move their fixed pieces and haven't been firing yesterday because they are concerned and are losing them. Obviously, these missile strikes over the last two weeks have been targeted at repair facilities, assembly facilities, so places that the Ukrainians would look to be putting together pieces of artillery or repairing damaged ones. If their ability to do that has stopped, then as pieces are flowing back from the front line because of damage or requiring maintenance, Ukraine's left and unable to restock them. Um, but again, out of today's the, the, the reported numbers here, m more than 50% of them are now self-propelled items. Interesting. So and on top of that, on just, just a, one thing to finish off here, on top of the um, losses the Ukrainians are suffering in terms of um, artillery, we're seeing now that the, there are reports that the uh, Russian 
Colizia SV self-propelled artillery piece are now being readied for delivery. Um, these are a powerful piece of equipment. Self-propelled, big gun. They have an option of a 152mm 2A88 gun or a 155mm gun. They have a quite amazing 10 to 16 shot per minute capability. So they can fire 10 rounds per minute and looks like they can get up to, for short periods of time, 16 rounds per minute. They have a 70 kilometer firing range, up to 80 kilometers with a rocket assisted shell. The um, defenseblog.com says these are modernized, they have all these, um, these Colizia self propelled have modernized automation for targeting, selection of targets, and navigation processes. Based on the T90 tank platform, designed to engage various ground targets, including command centers, communication nodes, artillery and mortar batteries, armored vehicles, anti air and anti missile defense systems, and enemy forces up to 70 kilometers away. Um, so these are rolling off the lines now and coming to the front line. Um, I did a, just a quick comparison of some of the other pieces of equipment that we often hear in terms of self-propelled NATO equipment. So if you compare this to the US M109 Paladin, which is a self-propelled device again, um, it has a maximum firing rate of three rounds per minute. This is a comparison to the Colizia uh, 10 to 16 rounds per minute and has a maximum firing range of between 18 and 24 kilometers. So that's about a third of the distance the Colizia can fire. Uh, the Polish Crab, it has a firing rate of two rounds per minute, as opposed to 10 or 16 for the Colizia, and a maximum range of around 40 to 50 kilometers. So still 20 to 30 kilometers short of what the Colizia can fire. Now, the M1299, the American M1299, which is still in development and which is part of the long range artillery program the Americans are developing, it's looking like it will be ready for some sort of release in 2024 and 2025. It has a maximum rate of fire of three rounds per minute. And it can fire from 70 kilometers up to 110 kilometers, but it only gets above that 70 kilometer range using the new XM1155 round, which itself is still in development. So, in reality, the American capability to deploy these M1299s to the battlefield um, and be able to outshoot the Colizia is probably a year to two years away before that will happen. Um, <clears throat> just one final thing then, just to finish off. So on the reporting of the frontline losses today from the Russian Ministry of Defence, they are reporting that the Ukrainians have had a very bad day on the front line and that their losses in terms of servicemen killed and wounded is, by summing them up over all those areas, is around 990, or almost 1,000 men. Now, some of you listening to this will say, oh, it's complete bullshit. As I've said before, just this week, a Ukrainian interior minister made an announcement that he believes that the Ukrainians are losing 1,000 men a day killed or wounded. So that's from the Ukrainian side. Um, today is a heavy day in terms of the Ministry of Defence of Russian reporting. As I said, usually it's more around the 700, 800 reported. Today it's 990 or nearly 1,000. Um, but this is, as I say, not an order of magnitude away from what the Ukrainian interior minister, minister of their parliament, has actually said this week. He is estimating that Ukraine is losing 30,000 men killed or wounded a month, 1,000 a day. Um, so I think we need to balance that and perhaps perhaps consider that we actually have converging data points from the Russians and the Ukrainians around what the actual Ukrainian losses might look like. Okay, I'll leave that there for today. Hey, if you're enjoying the channel and you think you know others who would, please share the link to the channel with them. And I look forward to talking to you again soon. I'm actually going to do another quick video now on the Middle East. So um, that should be up shortly after this one today. Have a good day.